This Week in Science and Education is presented in association with the Science Coordinators and Consultants Association of Ontario. Visit their website at sccao.ca. This Week in Science and Education is brought to you in part by the University of Western Ontario, www.uwo.ca. We thank them for their support. This Week in Science and Education is also brought to you by Laurentian University. Check out Laurentian at laurentian.ca. We thank them for their support. Hey everybody, it's time for This Week in Science and Education. This is TY's episode 75, recorded Thursday, April the 5th, 2012. And your host, Kevin Kugler from the Virtual Researcher on Call program. Hey everybody, thanks again for tuning in to us. Uh, we've got an exciting show for you today. Dr. Alberto Martin from the University of Toronto is going to talk about how antibodies fight disease. Alberto, thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, you're looking good. You're looking well, and uh, we're uh, we're pleased to welcome you to the show. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's nice to be on the show. It's the first my first podcast, so uh, I look forward to uh, this recording and, and it's, you know, telling you about the work that we're doing in our lab. It's all right. Let's hear a little bit about that work, Alberta. Can you give us a short uh, two-minute uh, synopsis on what did you mean by antibodies fighting disease? Exactly. What do you do over there at UFT? Sure. So, well, I'm sure many of you have heard of antibodies before, but a lot of people don't really know what they are. And they're these small little molecules made by a specialized cell of the immune system called B cells. Right? So the, the immune system is composed of different cells, uh, and, and they each have their own different function to fight infections, such as viruses, bacteria, and, and uh, parasites. Well, B cells is a specialized cell of the immune system, and their primary goal is to make antibodies, which are small little molecules that, that are very specific to binding to uh, specific viruses or specific bacteria or specific uh, parasites. Uh, and importantly, each B cell makes only one type of antibody uh, that will only bind to one specific uh, surface molecule, such as uh, a protein that's, pre that's expressed or that's present on the surface of a virus. Uh, and so, but of course, our body makes hundreds of millions of B cells every day. And so, of course, we, we have are producing hundreds of millions of different kinds of antibodies every day. Uh, so an antibody, really, you should think of it as a lock and key mechanism. You know, antibodies are very specific. They only bind us to specific a shape on the surface of a virus, much like a, a lock and key mechanism. You know, uh, a, my key will only open up my door. It won't open up somebody else's lock. Uh, and that's basically how antibodies also work. They're very specific. They will only bind to a specific uh, 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 shape on it on the, that's present on the virus or a bacteria. And basically what they do, these antibodies, is they coat, uh, let's say, a virus particle, uh, and then other cells of the immune system can can use those uh, uh, antibodies to, to basically, uh, let, such as a macrophage, can use an antibody to engulf the virus or the bacteria and eat it, essentially, uh, clearing the pathogen. But antibodies have, can function in many different ways as well. They, they can also, uh, also fixed complement, uh, which is a, a process uh, whereby pores are made in, in size, like on the surface of a bacteria, and what that does is essentially lyses or burst the bacteria. Uh, so that's essentially how antibodies function, and, and what we study particularly is how antibodies are made, but how also they're fine-tuned. So the initial antibody response to a specific virus is typically of a low affinity, which means that the antibody does not bind very tightly to the virus, but as uh, what happens is there's a mutational process that happens at, at the genetic level whereby an enzyme makes mutations in the genes that encode antibodies, and what that does is it increases the binding strength of that antibody to the virus. And this is essentially what we study, uh, which is how basically uh, antibodies are fine-tuned to bind more tightly to the virus or bacteria or the parasite that that's initially uh, produced for. Uh, and so one of the byproducts, unfortunately, of this process, which is called somatic cover mutation, is this enzyme, which is a mutator of DNA mutators, that sometimes it mutates the wrong genes. And it doesn't just mutate antibody genes. It can mutate other genes that, that ultimately lead to cancer. And so I'm sure you've heard of uh, cancers such as leukemias and lymphomas. And this enzyme called activation of deciding deaminase is, is, very, is a key uh, uh, oncogene that is a, a key uh, inducer of, of these types of cancers. So that's, in, in a nutshell, this is the type of work that we do in our lab. Okay, that's great. Thank you for that synopsis. Uh, let's go to Dr. Merita. Thomas, by the way, it's good to see you. It's been a little while. How have you been? 
how about if I take the mute off? I'm doing well, and I'll try again with the mute off. Um, I'm trying to con connect the dots in, in this system. So we're producing hundreds of millions of B cells every day. Is that is that correct? Am I am I with this so far? Approximately. That's correct. Okay. And those B cells are producing antibodies, but the antibodies are not initially specialized for a particular antigen. Is that correct? They're, they're made, see, antibodies are made uh, through a process called VDJ recombination, which is a very random process. Uh, and, and they're basically, VDJ recombination is taking bits of genes and putting it together. So it's all completely random. And so you're creating uh, specificities, this is what it's termed, random specificities. Right? Okay. And, so there are, and, and, and I should add, too, that what happens shortly thereafter, and these B cells are made in the bone marrow, uh, uh, and because they're random specificities, what's really important is to get rid of the B cells and make an antibody that can react to cell, which is us. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So that's very dangerous to have, and so there's an educational process that goes on in the bone marrow, whereby those B cells that make auto auto antibodies, those are antibodies specific to cell, they're deleted, they're, they're, they're killed. Right? So only those that do not make cell, i.e. Yeah. non-cell, are the ones that are allowed to survive. Right? Because we can't, our body can't predict the types of viruses or right. parasites or, or bacteria that we're going to get in the future. And new ones are always emerging. So it's really important that our immune system creates you know, a wide range of specificities. So uh, billions right, that, and trillions of different specificities. And that, that wide range is just a, a random process. So it's not exposure to a particular antigen that causes production of the right antibody. We're producing hundreds of millions of antibodies, and only the ones that are interacting with an antigen are being, those cells are being proliferated. Is that right? This is absolutely correct, yes. Wow. They're, okay, they're not only awesome. proliferating. So what happens is when uh, you get infected with a specific virus, is that those few B cells that are making the right antibody that can bind that virus, those B cells yeah. start to proliferate. But that's when this enzyme that we study called activation and deciding the amylase, or AID, is turned on. And what that enzyme then does is it mutates the antibody genes. And by doing so, it's randomly, it's subtly changing the antibody uh, so that it can bind more tightly to that specific virus. And that is the goal for that. So that's called secondary antibody diversification. So, but sometimes it's got to get it wrong, right? So if, if you start off with a B cell that has some, some amount of specificity for your, your antigen, um, and then you go through this random mutation process, some of the cells are going to have mutations that make them better binders, and some of them are going to make them worse binders? Very good. Yes, very, that's very accurate. So that's exactly what happens. And so there's a different selection process that's, that occurs in a specialized part of the body called the germinal center. And this is a part of the process where B cells that make a, a better antibody, we'll call yeah. it a better antibody, are selected to proliferate, right? Uh, those that make poor uh, the antibodies that don't bind very tightly will not be allowed to proliferate. So what happens is only those that make very high affinity antibodies or antibodies that bind tightly to the virus will proliferate and dominate that immune response. Because there's the higher numbers of those, then, and those B cells are then they're going to be producing a lot more antibodies than the other ones. The, the ones that make what we call low affinity antibodies typically uh, will also undergo cell death. So they disappear from the immune system. And so what only happens, what results after an immune response, which you know, this whole process takes about seven days from initial binding of a B cell to uh, production of very high affinity antibodies, is, is uh, uh, that your bloodstream fills up with uh, high affinity antibodies against that virus or bacteria, uh, leading to the clearance of that pathogen. So, Colin, you know, from, from a teaching yeah, point of view, yeah. this, this brings up a bunch of really neat ideas. I mean, one mutation, yes. which yeah. we, we always talk, we often talk about mutation in a negative context, and that, that's one of the things when I go yeah. into to high school classes, I try to put genetic, or put mutations in a broader context, but also the idea of random events, right? So mm -hmm. this is, it, it's an enormous number of random events that, that only a small fraction of those end up being maintained in the body. So how, how does this come into, or how could this come into a, a science curriculum? Well, you know what, and I've got a couple of questions, but this this leads into one of them. It's a really, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, to me this sounds like, like an evolutionary process. On, on a small time scale, using really small things, it mirrors almost exactly what happens sort of in, in the natural world on an evolutionary scale, a geologic time scale or whatever it happens to be. So, so my question then becomes, you know, am I right in thinking that it's really sort of a, a, a microevolution that we can sort of project and, and say that it's the same process, it's just at a different scale? Would that be fair to say? Yes. That's absolutely fair to say. So that, 
basically what happens is 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 you, the mutational process is completely random, exactly how how it occurs in organisms. You know, and, and in the organisms, when there's a changing environment, uh, the the diversity, the genetic diversity, is is what allows when when suddenly the environment changes, it allows a specific species with the right genetic mutations to survive and dominate in that new environment. That's exactly what goes on in, in the B cell uh, compartment, in the germal center reaction, which is mutations happen completely randomly, and those that have the, the right genetic makeup are the ones that uh, uh, feed into the genetic pool into the future. Because these antibodies or these B cells uh, will have be producing much higher uh, affinity antibody, and they're in a sense more fit uh, in the immune response. Okay. One, one thing I want to. Hang on, before we go any further, one thing I, that we want to be really clear on is everything yeah. that we're talking about right now is somatic. It's in the, it's not in the germ cells, and so it's not making it to the next generation. And so we can think of things in an evolutionary context, and we can, you know, we certainly, that's a great way to, to, to think about it. It's a great model to use, but we're talking about cells that are being mutated and that are proliferating in a single organism, but are not going from generation to generation to generation. And that has important impacts for our immune system. My daughter doesn't have my immune response. She isn't. She has not inherited all of those somatic mutations. So we, we need, you know, everybody, the, the students and teachers need to be clear about this. The mutation process is the same. The idea of the cells that are producing offspring are more fit, but we're not talking about changes that go from generation to generation. Thank you, which brings this me to right. my next exact accurate. question, right? And the question is, in, in natural selection, the feedback mechanism is surviving to the next generation. What I'm missing maybe in, in, in this is if, if, a, if an antibody becomes, you know, really fit, so to speak, and it's got a really nice fit to, to the binding site, then it gets, it gets destroyed by the macrophage when, when it gets engulfed in the immune system. So how's the feedback mechanism tell the B cells that this was the right fit? I'm, I'm missing something in that feedback right. process. Yeah, yeah. So, and th that's that's very very good. You brought this point up. So, essentially, B cells produce two types of antibodies: those that are secreted, and those are the ones that carry out the effective function. Those, those are the ones that basically kill the bacteria or the virus. But it's imp importantly, the the B cell also uh, produces a membrane-bound antibody. Right. So that antibody is attached to the cell, and it's. In the germal center reaction, that's the actual antibody that's very important. So that antibody is physically attached to the B cell, which is attached, you know, which contains the genetic information to produce that specific antibody, right? And so in the germal center reaction, affinity is measured uh, as a as a membrane-bound antibody binding to a virus that's being held by another cell. It's a specialized cell of the immune system called a follicular dendritic cell. It holds the virus. The B cell comes in. And if it can bind it very tightly, again, the B cell with the antibody attached to the membrane, if it can bind it very tightly, that, B, that transmits a signal to B cell saying, uh, yes, you have a very high affinity antibody. You can survive. You can, you can proliferate. Right? So it's, it's the two different forms of antibodies that are, 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 are playing role. It's the membrane-bound antibody is the one that's, that's imparting the survival signal to that B cell okay. and the proliferative signal and to that B cell. Excellent. Thank you. And for those of you that are uh, watching or listening in the classroom, you can start to understand how this podcast goes way over time usually because we have such interesting, entertaining guests. And, of course, Colin and Thomas are uh, speaking in a language that, uh, you know, they're just getting excited and carried away with themselves, and it's all great. But somebody has to install some order. So that is going to be me. We're going to break right now and thank our sponsors. We'll be right back with Dr. Alberto Martin in two minutes. Thanks, everybody. This Week in Science and Education is brought to you by Sheridan Institute of Technology and Advanced Learning at Sheridan Students Shine Brighter. Check out sheridanc.on.ca. And we're back. Our special guest today is Dr. Alberto Martin from the University of Toronto. We're having a fascinating discussion surrounding all sorts of interesting things that I don't understand, but thankfully that's not why I'm here. That's why we have Colin and Thomas. Colin, you were yeah. involved in the conversation uh, right before we broke. Do you want to follow up with a question to Alberto? That brings me to my next question because you had talked about the idea that, that these enzymes promote uh, mutations and that the mutations then subtly change the antibodies to get the right fit. But then you also talked about right at the first how these, uh, these enzymes also then cause mutations in other places that can lead to diseases. So my question is, is, is how does that work, right? So what kind of other types of cells does the enzyme affect and how does that then lead to some of these diseases that you were talking about? 
Right. So we're talking about the enzyme activation induced studying DNAs or AID. And this enzyme is primary, well, its only function really is to mutate the antibody genes. But but it does make mistakes, right? It's a, it's a very dangerous enzyme to have. We only have, in our body, we only encode two enzymes that actually cause uh, mutation. Uh, one is the RAG proteins that in, initiate BDJ recombination. They, they introduce DNA double strand breaks. And this enzyme is very specific in that it induces point mutations in two antibody genes. Uh, of course, it's a very dangerous process to have, a, a DNA mutator. I mean, a good percentage of our genome uh, in, in each of our cells is dedicated to maintaining our DNA, to keeping the DNA healthy, free from mutations. But of course, then we encode this enzyme that actually produces mutations. Uh, now, the, the question is, why, why does it mutate other genes? It is known to mutate other genes at significantly lower uh, rates than uh, it mutates the antibody genes, but it still does so. Uh, and we still don't understand why it does make a mistake, because we really don't understand, first of all, why this enzyme prefers to mutate the antibody gene locus. So that's an area of active research that we have in our lab and other people have in, in uh, other labs around the world. But we, what, what is absolutely clear is what this enzyme does is it mutates other genes, primarily some of the ones that it mutates are oncogenes. And it induces a, a specific process called a chromosomal translocation, in which you get a, 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 a chromosomal break, a break of a specific oncogene, and it translocates to a different part of the genome. So basically you get two pieces of DNA breaking and then ligating, and they shouldn't be uh, put together. And what that happens is that oncogene is now turned on or, or misexpressed. And what that happened, what that leads to is basically that B cell to become transformed. And when it comes transformed, it basically becomes what we know as lymphoma. So there's many different kinds of B cell lymphomas that that we all uh, suffer from. Uh, and we have to list them like chronic lymphocytic leukemia, diffuse large cell B cell lymphoma. There's a whole class of these that we think that one of the initiator or the biggest culprits for these lymphomas is this enzyme, mistargeting of this enzyme. So Alberto, I've got to let Thomas jump in with a question. He's going to jump through the screen any second. Go, Thomas, go. <laughs> the mutations that, that happen, I mean, when, we, when this enzyme is active inappropriately or is mutating uh, genes inappropriately, do those tend to ha happen late in, in the lifespan of the organism, or do we find them spread out? I mean, are these associated with childhood cancers, or are they, are they more predominantly associated with cancers that we see later in life? I mean, what I'm getting at is could this simply be that because selection basically stops happening once you have children, are the, are the accidents coming past the point of selection, and the reason we still see them is simply because they can't be selected out of the population? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I don't know that answer fully because I'm sure that the majority of the cancers that are caused by this enzyme do happen later in our lives. There's no doubt yeah. about that. But I think that's the case with all cancers. You know, cancers, it's a genetic disease. You, you, it's, it's, it's all about accumulating mutations. And ultimately, once you start accumulating enough mutations and you start activating the wrong oncogenes and, and, right. and inactivating the tumor suppressor genes, once you have a good collection of these types of mutations is now when you get a full-blown cancer. So I think with most cancers, they, they typically tend to occur later in life. You know, as you mentioned, at a late stage in our lives where maybe we're not that important anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but some of these cancers might uh, also arise early uh, in childhood. Uh, they might, some of these lesions caused by AID or cancers caused by AID might also occur in, in children. But we don't know enough about all the cancers formed by the, caused by this enzyme. Fair enough. May I ask but one, I would one agree more with you question? That yeah. Sorry, one more question. Just. Um, this type of immunity is not specific to humans, right? So do we have an idea um, how broad how broadly do we find the, the AID enzyme? I mean, invertebrates have a very different immune system than, than the vertebrates, but is this basically found in, in, in all vertebrates, or how broadly distributed is it? It's found in, in uh, vertebrates. It's found in some fish, jawless fish, such as lamprey. Uh, this enzyme is thought to be one of the, you know, it's still an area of ongoing research, but lamprey is thought to have the earliest ancestor of this enzyme called yeah. AID. And you're absolutely correct that lamprey and other, other organisms have a very different type of immune uh, system. They don't have right. antibodies as, as what we know our antibodies. Our antibodies are quite different right. from the antibodies that exist in lamprey. They call VLR, so uh, variable uh, leucine-rich uh, receptors. So they're very different types of 
anti antibody-like structures, but they still function as antibodies, but very different to the, the antibodies that exist in mammalian, such as us or mice or cats or dogs or cows. Okay. Uh, but, but basically, so far we've identified this enzyme AID all the way down to lamprey. It might even exist even well before that, but we have not identified that yet. That's great. Thank you. Alberto, um, last question for you today. What's the best part of your day being in cancer research? Well, I mean, that's a good question. I think, I, you know, it's basically, we're, we discuss, we're, you know, my job I find is, is very exciting. I actually enjoy Mondays. Unlike a lot of my friends, they hate Mondays. They love Fridays. I really love coming to work. You know, what, what we do is basically discovery-based research. We spend uh, every day thinking about, about uh, science, about biology, how biology works. And, and, I, and knowing what the limits of knowledge, you know, in our specific discipline is, and then trying to advance uh, that knowledge. It's very much like, you know, uh, 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 Christopher Columbus hopping on a, on a boat and, and, and marching across the Atlantic Ocean, not knowing what he's exactly going to discover. And that's essentially what we're, we're doing. We're, we're, we're discovering things, and sometimes we don't really know where we're headed, uh, you know, five years from now. Five years ago, I didn't realize I'd be studying what I am studying today, and, and I think that really is. Other scientists would say the same thing. Uh, so I really enjoy that. The other thing that I really enjoy is is really interacting with students and, and, and training these postdocs and seeing how they develop uh, and, 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 and you know, helping them to become independent scientists. I think that is also one of my uh, one of the reasons why I like Mondays as opposed to Fridays. Alberto, awesome. uh, thank, thank you. you so much for coming on the show today. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank, I, I really appreciate being on the show. Nice, nice to talk to all three of you. Yeah, it was great. Dr. To have Alberto you. Martin is a uh, Dr. Alberto Martin is a researcher at the University of Toronto. He joined us today from his office at the University of Toronto. And on behalf of uh, Dr. Thomas Merritt and Colin Jago, thanks everybody for tuning into this week in science and education. We'll see you again same time next week. Take care. Thanks a lot, everybody.